to my channel. Hey yo, hey yo, listen up, listen up, yeah. Hey yo, hey yo, hey yo. The wireless woman. You in charge of the girls, right? I am in charge of the girls. Are you in charge of the girls? I am in charge of the girls. Okay. All right, testing, testing, one, two, three. I'm testing my microphone for you and for me. So I've been doing pretty well. All things considered, the um, anti-anxiety medication that they put me on has been making me depressed. But it's been holding me in space. Um, Really, the hardest part about it is it takes the edge off. Things I ordinarily would care a lot about, I don't. And that can be a good thing, but it can also not be a good thing. You know, as a creative, part of what makes you creative is the imbalances in your brain, is your obsession with mundane and minute details that other people seem to overlook. You know, it is you kind of picking at that scab that other people don't necessarily want to get up under. That really unlocks a lot of creativity for creatives. We don't exist. We don't color within those lines like other people do. So when we are restrained to being within those lines, of course... It's helpful for the people who need you to be normal, but it is a creativity passion killer. So I have been feeling a little, you know, put off. And I talked in my Marilyn Monroe video about how those fit, feminine and friendly women were more often than not drug-induced. That was a drug-induced state. And the medication that I take, I take it at night. And um, so most of the time, by the time lunch comes around, I'm actually not hungry. It's unfortunate that my anxiety got the best of me to the point where I had to succumb to medical intervention. But at the same time, I'm proud of myself for doing what I've learned to do through my therapy process by advocating for myself and continuing the work of managing my anxiety because it takes a support system. It takes a whole group of people caring about you, but it also takes you caring about yourself more than anyone else can to say, to humble yourself and say, I've done all that I can do. I've done my best. I've tried my hardest. And now I need some help. That is the type of vulnerability that is not championed in black women. Um, it's not even always championed in women, period, but particularly black women. Us asking for help is looked at as a sign of weakness. And as much as we are being told that we need to be more vulnerable like other communities of women we are the least protected group of women and I know someone's gonna get mad when I say that but Malcolm X said that the most unprotected one a person in America is the black woman um and it has remained to be true even when we watched the crack not epidemic um happened we i mean we can't call it an epidemic because you know you know but even when that was happening in the communities and you had whole displaced families and communities of black children and women because of drugs you know there was no protection from within the community anyway for these black women. So we have to get creative about the ways that we are going to manage what this new era of accountability and responsibility for black women is supposed to look like. 
And for me, it has felt over the past few months, really years, if I'm honest, like everywhere I show up, someone has boulder waiting to put it on my shoulders. It just, it it's in every setting that I'm in, I'm required to go over and above in order to be accepted. In order for what I've done to be acceptable, you have to compete with other communities of women and then, unfortunately, compete with your own male counterpart. And people consistently get with me on that and they're like, well, you know, black women are so masculine and competitive. But I tell people it's always been this way. If you go back and you listen to Sojourner Truth's Ain't I a woman? I could work as much and, and, and eat as much as a man when I could get it and bear the lash as well. Points were brought forward in that piece going all the way back to slavery days, how black women and black men were put in fields together and they were expected, black women were expected to yield the same amount of production as a black man. It has always been this way. It has always been a competition between black men and black women for scarce resources, which is why, in my opinion, our men are afraid of us reaching our hand into those male spaces because they're already competing against another dominant male group for the same resources that we now have access to. <laughs> and, you know, I can only imagine what that can feel like to have another male group reaching over you as a man to now empower your females. You know, the fear, I talked about fear aggression in my Who's Your Daddy video, the fear that that type of empowerment causes within its own community. And I could say that this is the work of white supremacy. I could. But the problem is we as black women can't take 10 steps backwards behind our men in order to put them in the position that white supremacy has not put them in. Especially when those resources are available to them. You know, our education system has put women in competition against men, and this happens across the board, at what women actually do best. There's math and science and engineering and fields that men tend to show stronger proclivity towards being able to have dominance in those areas like Trust me, I know. I've been in male-dominated fields all my life, law enforcement. You know, all of these different areas where being a woman didn't give you an advantage. And I think that's the reason why I approach things in a certain type of way. I approach things so logically because when I was in those settings where males dominated the field, you can go back and watch movies like Hidden Figures where you can see how those women, those black women, had to conduct themselves in white male spaces in order to be respected and regarded and have their contribution matter and count, because that was the reason that they were there. My numbers are spot on. I will double check them, sir, no problem. When you're in those settings, you begin to recognize as a black woman because you see that same dynamic coming in your own community and in your own household, why it is that we cannot actually work together fundamentally at getting ahead because the system isn't set up for us to maximize the things that we do well as black people. When we were in an agricultural society, we were needed and we were necessary, but we were never educated at the level that we would be considered competitive with white society. And now that technology and education is really the only way 
that you can succeed in this society, we see the agricultural people, because we think this is just a black problem. It's not. This is a Hispanic problem, a Native American problem. We see the groups of people who have been used as chattel and labor falling behind. I'll give you an example. I know tons of black men. They have great thriving entrepreneurial spirit. They have great businesses, but because they lack the financial know-how, the financial education on how to invest money, because they lack the technological know-how of how to um, industrialize their businesses, really, really get from doing the groundwork to doing the managerial work. They haven't really been able to see the type of success that just based on their entrepreneurial spirit, their intelligence, it's a different type of intelligence. Like we talk about book smarts versus street smarts. It's a different type of intelligence, but it is a heightened intelligence. These are super sophisticated men, but they're in competition for scarce resources. And the system has been reworked from agricultural to industrial, industrial to technological, technological to digital, digital to media. And even in the media spaces, we're seeing the disparity. You know, I'm not on Kanye's side on this whole thing. I know if I'm black, I'm supposed to be, just like when Joe Biden told us, if you're black, you vote for Joe Biden. Some things y'all just falling for. <laughs> y'all just listening to a man talk about his blackness that has not been black for years, that made a whole non-black family, that invested with a non-black Nazi company in order to produce his Yeezys, but yet we're supposed to believe everything that he's saying about white supremacy when he's telling us that from the inside out. He's the spook that sat by the door. But anyway, I digress. My point is, we're still not the ones leading the charge on what comes next. You know, while Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos are out there putting stashes and stores of resources on the moon and creating moon destinations because they know something about what's going to happen to the earth that you don't know. We're still sitting here arguing over desirability politics and having a gender war. It's embarrassing at this point. And that is why I'm asking black women that you disengage. This was actually just supposed to be my test monologue, testing my sound. And it turned into like an actual whole episode. So I would actually like to know what your thoughts are on how we as black women. And like I said, black men are included to be a part of this conversation on how we can radically re-industrialize and revitalize our community. However, unfortunately, because Black men have been the architects of the culture that we are currently in, we're not going to be taking our cues on what we need to do next from you. One of the big things that I took from the Black Panther movie that I put in my Black Panther episode was watching these women rule, these women reign, and these women be unapologetic about doing what they needed to do for their communities. They had sat back and watched the politics of the men. They had watched one Black male panther kill another black male panther to have him be resurrected and come back to kill the same black male panther like we don't have time for that we just we just don't and that ended up costing Okoye's character her husband because she sided with the black man that was a traitor and then like I said it depends on how you look at it you know I'm all killmonger even in this, I was on the side of Namor. I'm just going to be honest with you. We keep giving these folks a pass, keep giving them a pass. They keep coming back into our community with their violence. We're not teaching them peace by being peaceful. We're teaching them aggression because we letting them know that if they bring that smoke, they ain't going to get no fight over here. Y'all know I'm Magneto. Y'all know I'm Malcolm X. So by any means necessary. 
I'm trying to find the medium though. I'm trying to find the better way because one thing that I did resonate with from that Black Panther movie, the Wakanda Forever movie, was that we can't let vengeance turn into revenge. We can't let our need to defend and protect ourselves as Black women turn into us being the same colonizing, oppressive people, you know, that we've been under the thumb and rule of in the past. We have to find a better, more perfect way to use our power and platform that we have now than what we've seen in the past. So I want to hear what your thoughts and what your ideas are as women what you see coming down the pike and what you want to do next. And like I said, men, feel free to chime in because the one thing I can say about these women is that they could not have accomplished the things that they accomplished without the input, wisdom, strength, and infrastructure that was created by their men. They were empowered by the strength of their men, Mbaku, and some of the elders that spoke. Because when the queen was talking and she was stripping Okoye, one of the male elders spoke, and I was completely with what he was saying. I was like, queen, you're being a little irrational here. Y'all and your emotions, not a good time to demote your general when you're in the midst of a war. Probably not the best idea. I was with the men on this one. I was like, listen, Okay, this this your right hand woman right here. But then when she had spoke about how Okoye sided with Killmonger and how she had these questions about her loyalty, I was like, hmm, forgot about that. You absolutely right. See, women, we be holding on to stuff. Our intuition be coming up. Whether she was right or wrong, my point in what I'm saying is it is these differing perspectives. It's the divine masculine and the divine feminine working in concert that creates the image of God. Made he them male and female in the image of God. So we have to have this exchange. We can't create life. We can't create children without this consent, without this exchange. But the child, the seed this planet, the child that's created comes forth from the women. And it is time for men to take a back seat and let the thing that they have planted in their own community, their women, these children, come up and speak for the character of who they have been as men. And they fear that. They fear these chickens come into roost, but these chickens are here. They have come back home to roost. And now it's time for those of us who are capable, who are in position, who have the resources and ability, who have taken the time honing skills to heal. It's a lot of black women in therapy, just like me. I started this whole discussion off about you know, having to submit myself as a woman to the processes that need to be put in place to sustain me, to make sure I can be better, to make sure that the things that I go through make me better, not better, which is what this podcast is actually supposed to be about. I'm going to do like a whole separate podcast now on that. Because this was just the test monologue for that particular podcast. But I hope you'll join me in trying to find the consent to compromise the halfway point. And I'm going to tell you, the halfway point isn't where some people are putting it. Some people are moving the goalposts, ladies, and we're way in enemy territory. The compromise, the the common ground is the place where we feel respected, dignified, where we're placed on pedestals that put us above other groups of women instead of down in trenches of competition with them. When we're put in a place 
that as the very reflection of the black men allows us to have softness, elegance, to be regarded by the world as the crown jewel of the black man until we have that. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. Thank you very much. Okay. And until the next time, make sure you subscribe to this channel. Leave me some comments. Drop that fire headphone emojis down in my comments. I look forward to engaging you there. Help me grow this community so that the conversation isn't so linear. It isn't so one-sided. There needs to be pushback. There needs to be discourse. And I'm here for it. I'm here for the smoke. I want all the pain. I want all the rage. That's kind of what say. Until the next transmission. See you in the next one. Section leaders, what is our concept? One band, one sound. One band, one sound.